rebellious research. I'm absolutely delighted to have Craig Batty with us today. Uh, I'm going to ask Craig to introduce uh, himself in a second. And as always, uh, the session is recorded. It's going to be available on YouTube probably by the end of today. Uh, again, depends on your time zone. So um, that's all from me. Um, and I'm just going to pass it on to you, Craig. Thanks, Agatha. Thanks again for the invitation and good to um, meet you all and see you all and some of you I know. So hello again. Um, I'm just going to share the screen and hopefully this will work uh, seamlessly. So let me know if um, well, if it doesn't. I'll just click play. Um, I'll try and click play. So that's all showing well and you can hear me. It's perfect. OK, and because I'll not be able to see the questions uh, typed at this stage, uh, I'll probably save questions to the end. However, if there's anything that comes up that's really urgent, you can perhaps add or perhaps um, signal and I'll stop or something. Absolutely. Um, I like these to be interactive and um, collaborative, but obviously sometimes it's quite difficult in these um, online situations. So I'm going to be talking today about uh, contributing to knowledge through creative practice. Uh, and I'm going to be using screenwriting as, I guess, the case study. I mean, I'll, I'll be talking more broadly about other areas that I'm familiar with, including filmmaking, screen production, creative writing, um, also art design and, and to some extent architecture in terms of the, um, the people I work with. Um, but I'm going to be using screenwriting as the specific uh, lens to look at this idea of contributing uh, knowledge. So. I hope it doesn't sound dry. I mean, it sounds like, as you'll see a bit later, it sounds like kind of criteria for examining a PhD or something, which it is, but it's also basically the, the basis or the premise of all um, research, research with a capital R, so, you know, uh, new knowledge. So I'm going to be talking through um, some, uh, uh, talking through a little bit around what we mean by contribution to knowledge, um, how it's kind of conceived of, particularly in the PhD space or the doctorate. Um, and I think that's a really useful um, way of looking at contribution because it's so, um, I guess, prescribed and so um, specific to um, what a PhD has to do. And remember, a PhD or a doctorate, in most cases, it is research training. And it's training you to, to be thinking and making and articulating and, and seeing the world at that doctoral level which is around then contributing to knowledge. So it's a really good way of looking at what contribution means. Um, but it doesn't just stop there, of course. That goes through any kind of uh, research capital R that anybody does uh, through academia or even through um, industry, industry or academic industry connections as well. So I'll just, um, uh, and I'm using screenwriting for, for those of you who, who are aware that my, my background is in screenwriting and a lot of my uh, research in the last uh, gosh, I'm feeling tired already. The last probably 10 years or 15 or, or whatever has been around screenwriting as research, creative practice research methodologies. And then in the last uh, maybe five years, looking at creative doctorates and also doctoral supervision. So some of the stuff I'll be presenting is based on research I've done as well. Um, OK, so let me just um, skip through this first slide. So. I'm just going to start by defining, uh, you know, I guess my or my definition or a definite definition I've worked on with one or two other people around what do you mean by screenwriting practice research. Now, obviously, you know, again, screenwriting can in many cases be replaced by screen production, filmmaking, creative writing, whatever it is you're working on. Um, but, you know, this is the definition which I published on uh, with a colleague a few years ago, and although I've added a few I always tweak things a little bit. So this essentially, you know, a practice in which the screenwriter like a, uh, makes use of the intellectual space offered by the academy, and sometimes that is with industry, so industry partnered um, research projects, for example, to incubate and experiment with ideas that are research informed with the intention that the screenplay, in this case, and or the screenwriting process changes as a result. So there's a few uh, deliberate words in there, if you haven't guessed already. Uh, and I guess the first one to think about is this incubate and experiment with. And I'll come back to that later when I quote a few other people. But this idea that um, research, 
creative research, practice-based research, uh, research and development. Some, pe some people call it in the industry, often calls it R&D, uh, and, and obviously doctorates in particular. It is about incubating, experimenting, and, and kind of testing and pushing boundaries. It's not just doing what you already do and just kind of adding something to it, like some documentation or, well, I'm going to write the screenplay anyway. I'm going to make the film anyway. I'll just kind of research something around it and kind of pull it together. I mean, a lot of people kind of do that or think that's what it is they're going to do, but it, but it, you know, actually, it's much more than that. You know, you know, for research to really to work and to function, it has to be this seen as a site or a space of incubation experimentation in order that the work, in this case, practice moves on. And so, this idea of changing and process changing uh, the the creative work itself, and I'll go into a lot of detail about this later. It actually moves on. It could, it shouldn't ever be during the research process and, and obviously at the end of the research process, the creative work, whatever form it takes, shouldn't be a, the same as it would have been without the research. Otherwise, it's not a research outcome. It, it hasn't moved on. And so I'm, I'm using there again the word or the expression research informed. I haven't got time to talk about this today, but you, you know, there's numerous uh, definitions, practice based, practice led, practice as, practice through, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And they all have quite different inflections and nuances. So I'm, I'm using research informed, A, because I think led and based and through can sometimes be a little misleading, but, but quite specifically here that the research is purely, absolutely, definitely informing um, uh, the research, the, the creative work. It's not just sitting at the side, it actually is doing something to it. And I'll, I will obviously go into much more detail about this uh, later. Um, it's also worth just recapping on, you know, where does screenwriting practice research sit in, in which kind of discipline areas or interdisciplinary areas? Um, I've, uh, I mean, I, I know a lot of, if not or most of the screenwriting practice researchers around the world, just because it's kind of my area and it's what I've been working on and uh, flogging for the last, um, I don't know, 15 years or so. But, you know, some people do come to screenwriting uh, practice research from creative writing. Uh, they identify as, as writers and creative writers, sometimes authors. Some of them uh, see screenwriting practice research as sitting squarely within screen or media production. And, and sometimes you have people who think that it can't be creative writing because that's too authorial and, and screenwriting is not that kind of thing and it has to be about production and outcomes. And so you often find differences of opinion about you know what, what, where, where this practice uh, sits. Um, you know, sometimes uh, as well, screenwriting practice research, particularly in the doctoral space, candidates come from maybe film and television studies. So they might not identify as practitioners per se, but they might be using practice to understand or, or, or do research in kind of film and TV studies, or they use film and TV studies as an underpinning background to practice, which is quite different to someone coming in and framing something as, a, as an artistic process-based kind of research project. And the kind of literatures that people look at or the, or the communities of practice around um, the other practitioners or policy or whatever is very different across these domains, clearly. Uh, I've seen research projects and examined PhDs that come, screenwriting PhDs that come out of performance, performance studies. Um, I remember examining a really great one from South Africa, which was looking at um, a particular actress, a particular performer, and using some particular performance kind of theories. And that was the uh, kind of almost the, the theoretical slash narrative premise of a biopic film. So it was a screenplay still, but it was also biography and they, they came from performance and the, the underpinning ideas and theories and the way to read the screenplay were from performance. And their history as well, that was also part of historical, but some people come from history. Uh, sociology, you know, some people, uh, you know, in the screenwriting research projects will do a lot of, um, I don't know, community-based research or sociology-based kind of interview types of projects. So they're using more sociological uh, methods to underpin screenwriting practice research, which again is quite different to someone coming in, say, from creative writing, who is looking at 
maybe something around narrative style or craft or um, story worlds or whatever. So very different um, domains that bring in different literatures, practices, methods. Uh, and it's not uncommon either for, for screenwriting practice research to be situated within cultural studies or even English literature. So you can see that they're not, um, every, you know, they all come from different spaces, different domains, which means they're all going to be quite different. And, and as I'll come to later, the contributions to knowledge, uh, what the screenplay in this case is, is, is producing as a knowledge outcome is quite different because they come from different places. Um, we also have different um, linked to this, different critical lenses or different conceptual frameworks that are brought to screenwriting practice research. And as I've kind of mentioned before, some people really come to this um, this area as uh, you know, it's about creative practice, it's about process, it's about creativity, it's about creative action um, activities, etc. That is a kind of a, a kind of a lens to bring to it, or, or, or potentially a framework. Some people come to screenwriting practice research with more of an industry studies kind of lens or framework. So whether it's, I don't know, genre or something around policy, it could be something around kind of production processes. So not individual processes as a creative, but actual uh, production culture processes. Um, and it could also be about the kind of the, the text or the product. So, you know, what what what, what does a, if someone did, for example, something around script development, and there's been a few of these projects and PhDs as well, where you know the findings of the of the research might be somehow embedded in the screenplay as well as the, the written dissertation or exegesis. But what they're actually looking at is um, they're looking at industry practices and, and kind of and where development documents, for example, sit within this process. So they're looking at development documents, industry processes, it's essentially kind of industry or production studies using creative artifact as one of the core outcomes. And again, some people come from more like critical theory. So, um, and this is not that uncommon these days in, dare I say, younger uh, PhD students, if we're thinking about PhDs, who, who might be closer to have studied undergraduate honours level kind of, um, or even master's um, work. In Australia, honours, which is a slightly different structure, is the pathway into PhD. Um, in the UK, it's obviously a master's, usually. Uh, so people might come in with a really strong sense of kind of theory, like gender, sexuality, race, memory studies, environmental studies, environmental humanities, post-humanist kind of theory. And they might use that as a way into the, um, to the, to the practice project. So it's not that they're coming in knowing exactly what the project's going to be and then trying to find a way of framing it, they might very well come in going, I want to do a creative project that explores or tests or questions or blows apart or whatever theories of blah. And then obviously they know it's going to be creative. It could be a film as well, of course. But but what they're trying to do is, is understand how theory can inform practice, i.e., you know, the narrative styles or aesthetics or, or, or forms. So um, again, all very, very different. And, and I guess that also maps into people's career stages and you know, where they've come from, where they want to go as well. What what do you want to get out of the work? If it's a if it's a doctorate, but, uh, but, but even just generally, what do you want to get out of it? How's it going to help what you do next? Um, so that's just an overview of the, the real differences in the kind of ways you can conceptualize screenwriting practice research in different disciplines and different lenses and frameworks all the while having at the core of it this kind of uh, screenwriting practice research definition there to show that there is a, a core purpose to to all people who do this kind of work which is they come from different places so in a way um you know, yeah, in a way, screenwriting is a discrete area of practice space. And again, I'm highlighting practice space there to, to show that there's different terminology, but I'm using that. I find that the most uh, all encompassing, but um, we can talk about definitions later if you like. It's a discrete area of practice based research, which is, you know, arguably situated between creative writing and screen production, noting that some people have different, different views about that. 
also quite clearly within screenwriting studies. And for those of you who are aware that screenwriting studies is still a fairly new discipline. Um, it's probably about coming up to 15 years old now, maybe 13 or 14. Um, um, started off in the UK at the University of Leeds with collaborators from Denmark and Finland and the US, eventually leading to the Journal of Screenwriting, for example, which is um, 13 or 14 years old now. I should know because I'm the editor, but I think it's 14. Um, the current editor, I haven't been doing it for 14 years. Um, so you, we can now safely say that screenwriting practice research is within screenwriting studies um, or script development, which is emerged in the last five years as a subset of screenwriting studies and we've uh, some former PhD students and myself wrote a journal article about looking at research script development as a kind of a research um, domain so looking at re research led script developments looking at um, their PhDs in particular um, but obviously it is its own thing but it does sit within other um, disciplines I'll just mention, and I'm sure uh, many of you, you are aware of this already, but there has been, um, again, maybe 10 or so years, an increased recognition of screenplays as research outputs or research artifacts or research objects that do research uh, in their very kind of fabric. So the actual, the knowledge, the contribution, as we'll talk about, is actually embedded in the script itself, whether it's around representation or style or, or voice or form or any, anything like that. It's not just a script that exists that is exactly the same as a normal script with some commentary at the side. The research has actually enabled a new kind of script to emerge, something that does something within its own, within its DNA essentially, um, that the research has um, enabled, which is why we call it a kind of embodied knowledge that the script or in other cases, the film or the novel or the artwork or the sculpture or whatever embodies the knowledge in its very fabric or its very DNA. And that is the, the crux of creative research. Um, but in terms of screenplays, it, it, you know, uh, most people um, would say, well, the screenplay only exists to be produced. Others have argued that the screenplay is a text. It, it, should have, can and should be valued as a, as a kind of a literary form, if you like. Um, and this is why over the last 10 or so years, there's been numerous attempts to uh, publish scripts as research outputs in kind of creative practice journals, including text, which is based in Australia, new writing, which is based in, well, kind of America, UK, depending where Grant Harper's working at the time. Or also sightlines filmmaking in the academy, which is a uh, it's an event plus a, an online journal. There's also other ones like um, International Journal of Creative Media Research and Journal of Artistic Research. They haven't really done screenwriting, but these ones have done. Uh, if, if you look at them um, first, sorry, the first one, the text and the sightlines is open access, so you can just see them uh, quite easily. New writing has got some scripts in there, and, and um, but oh, you, you do need like a subscription, which is your university should have that. And, and in these cases, especially in text and sight lines, you find that people have you know published scripts. Sometimes they're short scripts, sometimes they feature scripts, and then there's often an accompanying research statement that, that situates what the what the script is doing as a research um, output. <clears throat> so there's been stronger recognition. Certainly, obviously, academic recognition that screenplays can be published um, and, and count as outputs in their own right, even if the film or the TV show or the web series or whatever it is isn't actually produced. And I'll just briefly mention I'm going to talk about the doctorate quite quite a lot today. Um, screenwriting doctorate is is definitely growing strongly around the world, uh, and I use the word doctorate there because. We often say PhD, but we, there's different models. You've got the PhD, you've got the, the DCA, which is a Doctorate of Creative Arts, which was very popular in Australia. It's kind of dying out now, but it was there. The DVA, which is sometimes the Doctor of um, Visual Arts. And you've got the DCI, the Doctor of Creative Industries. Um, there are different terminologies. I mean, PhD is the most common, but um, that's why I use the word doctorate, because it's not always a PhD per se. It's something a bit different. Uh, and these are really rough numbers. I'm kind of counting, you know, kind of at the top of my head from, from what I know, who I've met, what I've examined. I've examined quite a few 
um, screenwriting PhDs, I think about 30 in the last um, 12 years. I've also had about 25 of my own students complete. So there's, you know, like 50 odds just there, but I reckon there's about 75 screenwriting PhD completions around the world and roughly probably 75 currently enrolled. I mean, that's hard to tell. Uh, 75 is actually not a lot. I mean, it might sound like that's quite a lot, but when you think about creative writing, there's probably, oh, there must be, gosh, at least probably a thousand more around the world. Screen production, filmmaking, I'm not quite sure, but I would say, yeah, probably more than 75, but probably not more than maybe 150, 200. Bearing in mind that most creative doctorates are done in the UK, Australia, New Zealand, Ireland, increasingly in places like um, South Africa, the couple in the, in the US, maybe Canada, but it's still a growing area. Um, the creative doctorate in music, that's different. That's a kind of a very old kind of one of the first areas, but that's, I'm not going to talk about music today, but that's quite a different model in many countries. It, it's not quite the same as what we would see as a PhD. It's this eminent kind of thing you do in your career that, that, and it, it's framed quite differently. Um, most projects in screenwriting uh, doctorates are original or adapted feature films or is an accompanying dissertation. And I say that, uh, and I use the word traditional there, things are changing, and I'll, I'll explain in a minute, but, um, you know, if you think about screen production nowadays, you think, well, you know, there's obviously it's the rise of huge serial TV streaming, streaming services, web, web series, etc. Feature films is by, by far the most predominant. So in a way that is quite traditional and the company, dis company dissertation is literally you have two artifacts, you've got the script and then you've got the dissertation or exegesis. And that is the common but most traditional model. Uh, and unlike in screen uh, screen production and creative writing, most, most screenwriting projects are fiction or um, kind of hybrid fiction kind of memoir. Creative writing, obviously people write fiction, obviously, but also a lot of creative writing doctorates are memoirs. And in screen production, you find that most works are documentary. You do get feature films, uh, sorry, fiction films as, as, um, as PhDs, for example, but most of it is, is, is documentary. Whereas in screenwriting, it tends to be more fiction. There are certainly an increasing number of TV uh, cross platform hybrid kind of screenwriting uh, doctorates coming through. Um, I think the last few that I've supervised and examined have been in television and also this kind of hybrid fictor critical where you have the, I guess, the critical theory, the ideas, the reflective practice embedded within this, uh, the script itself. Uh, it's the kind of a script that an in industry person will probably go, oh gosh, what is this? But in terms of research, it's actually really exciting. So you get this really hybrid kind of very textual, um, to be read kind of output. So they're more experimental. And I think uh, what we're seeing over, over the last few years is that people are really starting to recognize what research can do for practice, in this case, the screenplay. I'm not just seeing it as this here's a film or a script that I would do anyway, and here's some dissertation that I write around it. It's kind of go, right, let's just put everything on the table and say, what could this be? How could it be different? I think you had a, uh, maybe a couple of se a couple of sessions ago, you had Catherine Goff Brady um, from Melbourne, who um, was one of my PhD students. And um, I think Jill was one of the examiners, actually. Um, and that was fantastic because it was a, it was a, she came in, she had a strong idea. I remember the first ever meeting we had, I remember she had a very strong idea this is before she enrolled, before she applied, very strong idea. She wanted to, she'd been making a documentary about some woman um, in Indonesia that she'd been filming for a number of years. She wanted to kind of make the feature documentary and then write something about something. And we said, oh yeah, that could work. But then we talked about 
what research can do that kind of moves things on a bit and it, it's kind of let's just wipe this like clean what are you really interested in and what we ended up with was a series of experiments that she did and so she ended up with a series of short uh kind of experimental films if you like with interleaving kind of critical essays i think and most of them were published during the doctorate plus the creative works were all screened in some form so she had this i think in the final dissertation it was like a, she visualized it as like a, as a honeycomb so you had all these i don't know what they i guess the, the whatever shape they are in the middle they're not are they pent hanks whatever but they were all like kind of uh connected in different ways and that was the honeycomb structure so you could see visually that she got this series of works, like a portfolio of it, really. They had a through line, but it wasn't your traditional. And we're seeing that um, in screenwriting as well. As I mentioned, kind of fictocritical um, hybrid kinds of, uh, of, of screenplays. Um, there's various journal articles and book chapters have been written by this group of people and, and others as well around what is the screenwriting doctorate so that so if people are interested there, there is quite a lot of literature out there already and i'll just uh, highlight these quotations around um again just this notion of what research can do for um for practice and in particular setting up this so idea of... sorry, oh am i back repeating the last thing yes you're back yes oh sorry uh was it the slide i was on or Oh, it was just the last sentence. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. Oh, that's all right. That's all right. Um, so, well, I, I was just saying about the these um, quotations are really trying to highlight the this nature of you know what research can do for practice rather than just um, something that you do almost as a chore alongside the creative work. Um, so here we've got the possibility for surprise for the kind of creative disruption that precedes innovation. So I'm highlighting keywords here, improving and or innovating practice, and by doing so create knowledge about practice, etc. Uh, to challenge notions of traditional research and make uh, space for doing representation differently. This one here from Burberry, she's actually a um, yeah sociologist who who studies um, people and, and kind of relationships and networks and she did a study of a group of first year female university students at the, at the US university and as well as writing up journal articles she's not a screenwriter per se but she realized that all the relationships and the nuances and the dialogue and everything that she witnessed during this kind of ethnographic work was so powerful that she said you can't just write about this in a journal article so she actually wrote a script to really highlight and embody all of the data if you like that she picked up all of the the relationships the nuances the subtext all of that stuff she thought i need to find a creative way to 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 show this because journal article kind of writing doesn't fit the bill and so she wrote a screenplay, which she's got excerpts in her journal article about it. And so it's really interesting that has someone from a totally different discipline uh, wanted to do that. And then this this final one, which I love, Alison Holbrook, um, who I work with quite a bit on on some of my stuff. And I, um, I've sent through an article we did together when she's done a lot of work on the doctorate. And this is a study they did of um, visual arts or fine arts doctorate uh, candidates and it was this idea of and they interviewed them as part of it and it was this idea that doing research or doing a, a research degree can really inject new rigor into your practice so in in some disciplines like fine art it is common to get uh, candidates who have got well-established practices and then they may be eminent award-winning people so in a way it's kind of quite scary for them to come back in and go well I'm almost starting again and how is research going to help me but this is uh, from one of the interviews they did and you know, one of the, the key things that came out from a lot of these people was it gave them this new rigor that they could inject which they hadn't had the chance to do before and take their thinking in different ways new paradigms so they saw this as a real um possible you know real strong uh, possibility for shifting the practice 
So let's get on to contributing to knowledge. So what does so what does all this mean, and, and where are we going with this? I'll just give a few definitions, and there are quite a few from different areas. Um, and again, as usual, they're all they're all different, probably because they're all trying to contribute their own knowledge about contributions to knowledge. Um, this one is a bit old now, but um, it's probably one of the first that kind of looked at new knowledge and, um, and and kind of research contribution in the creative areas from, um, it was looking at um, art and design in particular, it was Darren Newbury, the UK Council of Gra uh, Graduate Education, 1997. So that's, uh, it's like 26 years old. Um, and he just said, you know, that he was, he is what new knowledge or, you know, in terms of uh, creative research could be innovations in design, aesthetic development, methods and methodologies, new understandings, models, blah, 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 empirical novelty. And you'll see that over the years, that you, they're quite generic and they're, they're, they're still fine in many ways. But, you know, this is back in the day when people were just starting to go, what is this thing and how do we even conceptualize creative research? So over the 20 odd years that people have been researching this quite formally, you'll see that the 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 discourse has changed and it's become a bit more, I guess, more precise or, you know, people have got new, newer ideas. For this. So this is what he said back in 97. Um, Jerry Wellington, uh, who come, he's not a creative, is I think it's um, education. He did a, uh, an article on doctorateness, uh, which is not really a word, but anyway, um, he, you know, he, he gave a list of the kind of things that you might want to consider uh, to be doctoral. So building new knowledge, I mean, that's kind of obvious, really, but, you know, it's there. Original processes or approaches, new syntheses, exploring new implications for practitioners, policy or theory or theorists, revisiting a current issue or debate, replicating or reproducing earlier work differently, uh, presenting research in a novel way. That's an interesting one because you could argue in creative research that everybody does that and it's not it's almost a given nowadays i think it's a you know that i would say that's probably a little bit uh, loose if you if you kind of use that as your definition but um again this is 10 years old now uh, in 2017 allison and i we did an article where we looked at this and other models and we kind of applied it to creative writing in particular including screenwriting so if um and that's the article i think i've shared so it will come around to you or, or um, it's online it's an open access one anyway uh, it's called contributing knowledge in creative writing what where how i think we almost said why but that was another maybe that's the side article um so this is wellington on what doctorateness is what is contribution essentially i thought it'd be useful to look at what um what are the actual criteria for a doctoral degree? Now, every university has slightly different criteria. So this is the specific wording for a university, but um, it's all roughly the same around the world. So, you know, if for those who are doing doctorates here, I know there's some of you here, um, hopefully this is not too scary, but this is essentially the, the kind of the baseline. <laughs> so, you know, a substantial, original, and significant contribution to knowledge or understanding in the field of study. Now, those words, substantial, original, significant, I think they can be quite scary. But, you know, I guess the point is they're not, you know, the criteria is not just saying, oh, just do something. And if it's interesting and if it kind of hangs together, it's fine. It's actually got to produce some knowledge. It's got to do something and add to the stock of knowledge. Knowledge meaning practice as well, of course. Um, expert understanding of theoretical knowledge and the ability to reflect critically on relevant theory and practice. Intellectual independence in evaluating existing knowledge and ideas, planning and undertaking systematic investigations to generate original new knowledge. And that systematic investigation, that's basically saying, are you aware of your methodology? Can you articulate the methods and methodology so that other people could do the same kind of thing or you could um, you can explain to people how it all came together, how it all came to fruition. And even if you're one of those candidates or researchers who likes to do things chaotically and it all kind of just comes together and you just, it's all random. Well, there are actually theories about that. So you almost, so you better know all the theories of what that is. And lots of people have written about that kind of approach to, to doctorates as well. Um, so there's always going to be some theory or some framework or model around anything you want to do. Even if you wanted to just throw all the rules out the window and do something anti 
well of course there's loads of theory about anti stuff anyway so you might as well just look at that um there's obviously irony in a lot of these studies um technical and creative skills including use of relevant research principles and methods communication skills explaining critique their field of research that's an interesting one because it's not just explaining and documenting your field of research but critiquing it i.e in your literature review or practice review or your uh, or equivalent sometimes it's threaded throughout it's not a separate thing you need to be critical of the field and then show showing where the gaps are or what maybe hasn't been done and how your work um, contributes to it so it's not just um, you've actually got to be quite aware of everything around your area in order to be able to articulate what you're doing in it for it um, and this is an interesting one which i don't know if every university puts this actually but over, over here they do an ethical approach and high levels of research integrity um, that's a kind of a separate topic, but that's a really important thing as well. So let's just talk briefly about e examining and assessing contribution and what does all this look like um, when you're examining an Agatha Jill, maybe others who he would have examined as well, and certainly with their own candidates, seen examiners' reports, read a lot of them over the years. And interesting how many examiners still have different views about what, what creative research is and what contribution looks like. So this is just a few um, text heavy slides about uh, examiners. So and this is partly drawn from the work I did with Alison, but also some of Alison's own work where they've, they've done a, a big study of about 1500 examiners reports around the world on PhDs. And so we use the kind of the creative subset to, to look at some of this. Um, I mean, you know, this may seem obvious, but here's just a snapshot of the kind of words that an expression that examiners use when they refer to originality and contribution in their in their reports so you've got obviously the words original significant highly original original topic blah 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 so you can see that people examiners are obviously using this terminology but um and you can see that they're using it in different ways and I'll, I'll come on to this in a second but and especially at the end when i show you some examples of things further comments embedded in there but also further comments indicate a perceived level of contribution so you would think in a way that contribution to knowledge is a contribution to knowledge and so it's kind of it's all the same level but of course it's not you know you might have a, a contribution to knowledge you might have a substantial contribution to knowledge you might have a, a paradigm shifting contribution to knowledge you might have numerous contributions to knowledge numerous knowledge systems in which case you're probably a genius and you probably did a phd when you were at school or something but um you know this, this idea that the, 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 there isn't the same they're not the same level and i'm sure if you've seen any exam uh, phds if you've ever read any or, or seen any creative works from them you'll know there's quite different levels and sometimes it can be quite uh, sobering to see what has passed actually. Um, so some of the examiner comments here, you've got valuable and publishable, impactful within a field of a publishable standard, worthy of publication. Um, also, of course, comments like not original, not yet making a contribution, not publishable. So just to highlight what examiners, uh, how examiners talk about contribution. So exam, uh, sorry, academics combine use and nuance the words significant and original contribution to distinguish the quality of the research, noting that significant contribution could be regarded among the highest of accolades. For new fields of doctoral research, such as creative arts, and in particular screenwriting, because it's one of the newest of the areas, uh, it's probably, yeah, 13, 14 years. It's salient to note that whilst there is clearly a uh, clearly understood expectation that PhD research will be original, understandings of what this looks like can vary across disciplines and subject areas. And we'll see when I show some stuff later how, how this works out and obviously we can talk about it in question time. Um, understanding of what contribution to knowledge is can vary quite significantly. I remember back in the day people used to say, Oh, well, every creative writing uh, PhD is novel, it's original because no one's ever written that book before. 
and the, so of course it's new and it's like yeah but that's not what new knowledge means it's not you know it's got to have it i mean obviously it's not just the book it's just the, the dissertation or exegesis as well but it's not just about you know i could say well no one no one's ever sat in this chair before with this glass and presented to you guys ever before but this is not you know this is not a contribution to knowledge i mean hopefully the presentation is but it's not that's not there's novelty there's trivial novelty there's um research novelty there's etc cetera, etc cetera. there's also an, an important point to make in this in these fields which is is it a contribution to knowledge knowledge meaning of course theory meaning practice meaning industry meaning policy whatever or is it a contribution to one's own understanding there are a lot of candidates phd candidates in particular even researchers actually who mistake knowledge or contribution to mean that they've never understood it before or they've never known this before therefore that's a new contribution well that's not because how can that be validated um so even if you did a pr process-based kind of phd or project where you reflected on your process you know where is the new knowledge there may be new knowledge there may be but also it may be that you've just done something and discovered oh, i never knew that i i did it that way before and i just realized this is what i do and that's new knowledge well maybe but you know that's like saying i don't know a good old marriage counselor or a therapist and you realize something you've never realized because they've enabled you to understand how you operate or whatever that's not PhD, that's not research and knowledge. It's just it's a new understanding that you didn't have because you had a blind spot or something. So just be a little bit careful around whose knowledge and what, what is knowledge. Um, in a recent study, some examiners during interview acknowledged that words such as original can have reasonably loose application. For example, one, ex one examiner said when interviewed, I think at times this is problematic because how much of an original contribution do you need to make? Some examiners take a view that it could be trivially new, if you like, because you're simply doing things in a different context. So there's a trivial novelty to it. But others, of course, are less forgiving. It's probably me as well as one of these in their interpolation of original significant contribution. For example, when this examiner said, I think maybe I'm a bit old fashioned, but I do think it ought to be a contribution to knowledge. I think you really want to be able to see what this person has added, either by looking at material in a fresh way applying theory in an interesting way, coming up with a methodology or a theory, recovering material that's been lost. There should be some genuinely originality, uh, some original material to it. So originality, and you know, we've got there some examples of what this contribution could be, is quite different to a trivial novelty. Oh, I, you know, no one's done it in this context before. So again, uh, really scrutinizing what is a contribution. So I just come up with some kind of questions here for candidates, supervisors, but also examiners really thinking about the different dimensions of contribution. Hope they're useful um, before I go on to the next bit, which is a bit more meaty in many ways. Um, are examiners assessing effort over contribution? The candidate has done a lot of work, therefore award the PhD. You know, if you get a package, well, I mean, most of them are digital these days, but, you know, if it's really thick or it's, I don't know, 362 pages or whatever, you might go, wow, that's big, they've done a lot of work, but it might be crap. It might be just kind of going over all ground. You might have a much shorter thing that actually makes a stronger contribution. I think, you know, effort is one thing and it is a lot of work, but there has to still be that newness. What do examiners accept as doctoral level work? And is this good enough? That sounds provocative, but trust me, I've, having examined further PhDs, what, when is a creative artifact a doctoral level creative artifact? Like, you know, if you uh, read something or saw something that wasn't in a uh, research context, could you argue it's doctoral level? What's the criteria? You know, is it around? Is it is it is it innovating? Is it um, you know, recovering some lost archives or something, or, or is it presenting you new voices or new perspectives or whatever? Uh, is it doctoral level? And with your work, of course, you know, how do you know when it's doctoral level? How do you know when it's that research level rather than just a good piece of creative work? That's really hard. 
but it is um, a really important thing to think about. And can you articulate, as we'll come on to, what that contribution is in the work itself, not just about the process and writing about it, but actually in the work? Um, is the assessment of a PhD holistic or are examiners still commenting on the creative and critical work separately? Combination of the parts, the thesis of a whole is, is really what should be examined. I, if I went through all my examiner's reports, which I think I did for something a little while ago, and just did a bit of a check around what I was saying. In most cases, the big thing that people m miss is having a strong sense of how the creative work and the critical work dissertation exegesis kind of combine and what, what is the overarching thesis what is the argument um and often you know people might if you put in your report you might need to do a few revisions or add a few pages about whatever they do often um yeah they do that and they, they kind of really um get what you're trying to say and I've had quite a few candidates who've written to me afterwards and said oh thanks for examining and, 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 and I had this extra bit of work but wow I didn't realize the uh, and that's because they probably hadn't really understood that there's literature there about creative doctorates or creative research and also maybe the supervisors hadn't really encouraged that as well but you really need something whether it's in the abstract and or the introduction or a methodology chapter if there is a chapter because sometimes there isn't one separate one you really need something to say that what is the creative work doing how is it contributing and how does that relate to the underpinning theories what is the actual research guts of what what you're doing it's not just a plus b it's a and b equals c c is the contribution clearly i just made that up but it works so anyway that's something to think about uh, and, and you know what is the doctoral task of the creative practice phd thinking and doing it really should be transformative and assessed as transformative where is the evidence of this um you know we, we've kind of moved on 20 odd years around creative doctorates and creative research and we, we've got a much stronger understanding of what it is there's so much literature now about this so what is the can we really articulate what is the task of a doctoral level or research level cre creative work and, and you know um and it has shifted over the years. You look back at early creative research works, early PhDs, they were much more do the thing you're doing and then just write about how you did it and just package it together somehow. Nowadays, it's much more what is the research question or proposition? What are you trying to get at? Where is the literature or the practice review or equivalent? And how does that inform what the creative work needs to become? Many of my PhD students come in and said, I'm doing this as a creative work. I know what I'm doing. And I go, do you really? And then like three months later, six months later, they go, wow, no, no, my idea is rubbish. I didn't realize this. I've read all these theories about this and now I realize that I've got to do this kind of thing instead. And you go, yeah, because the research is telling you where to take it. Um, whether it's aesthetically, narratively, uh, content wise whatever it is representation whatever the area is and is again is the is the creative work in a phd is it how it would appear outside of a phd so has the practice the output it's moved on or is it only an understanding of how you've under, undertaken the practice or the process now those kind of phds are still valid um particularly in areas like design where it's all about the process and the process is documented and that is the artifact but really you've got to think about if you're producing a, a major creative work or professional work out of it what how has it moved on from the initial ideas you had and can you pinpoint where the contribution is is it in characterization or is it in particular technical techniques or particular um i don't know editing styles or whatever it is that are really underpinned by research which means you have to look at other things, literature, practitioners, communities, interviews, whatever you do, whatever the methods are. Um, so I'm just going to whiz through. Um, so I've been working on a project where we've been looking at um, completed, examined and com completed uh, past um, screenplay PhD screenwriting PhD projects 
and looking at how candidates have articulated or not their contribution to knowledge. So the questions we're asking, the, the overarching question is for this project is how do doctoral theses re reason for articulate the creative artifacts of the screenplay as a contribution to knowledge? How are they actually, do they know what the contribution is? Do they know how it is manifest in the creative work? And how do they talk about it? So some of the questions, sub questions are how and where do candidates articulate this contribution? Are they able to reason for how the screenplay is or, or is part of this contribution? Here's a good one. Here is there a logic to the research question posed, the methodology used, and the creative outcome? Sometimes the research question and the creative outcome they don't actually match up. That's an interesting thing. It's even the ones that have passed. Is it possible then to trace it within a thesis the contribution of knowledge from research question to screenplay or script development documents? And now you think, well, of course, it should all add up, but yeah, you'll see. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, shift away from this uh, this notion. This was based on an interview that Jenny Wilson did for her her own PhD, which looked at creative artists in the university sector in Australia. Um, Jenny Wilson was British, but she lives in Australia, and she published a book called Artists in the University, which is a really good book. And one of the interviewees setting she, she published on in 2014 was, there's not really a lot of difference in what I did as a practitioner and now what I'm doing as a researcher. Just the awareness that it's research means that data gathering is more disciplined than recorded. So they're documenting process and, and aware of all that, but they're, they're saying the practice hasn't changed. And I think that's a real missed opportunity. I think in this new kind of second generation of creative research and creative doctorates, that is the baseline, really. Um, so this is about how can, how can the screenplay in this case demonstrate new knowledge through its form. So we looked at a selection of theses. We looked at Australian ones only, um, publicly available. So they're all in repositories and things. You can find them. Obviously, most universities have them in repositories or libraries like the British Library obviously over there and the Australian Library Trove we have that here. Uh, we did a word search of certain sections, abstract reflection methodology, reflective, reflective sections and conclusion. We look for these kind of words, try and find passages of where people said things. And we've anonymized them. Obviously they're not named or anything and we've actually um, anonymized the kind of dis the kind of the the specifics of what they're talking about, whether it's the genre or TV type or whatever, because obviously reputational purposes, both ways, we don't want to be, you know, but so we've kind of anonymized them. And then at the end, I'm going to share with you some really early draft uh, kind of composites. I'm trying to, I want to actually publish, showing what, what we're trying to get it here. So I'll just whisk through these because we've got about 35 minutes, but we need time for questions. And what we came up with was this um, this framework. Basically, it's got four sets, it's two halves with sub halves. We've got convincing and unconvincing. So the analysis led us to believe there are four types of uh, reasoning for contributing to knowledge. One is sophisticated treatment. The references contribution are constructed carefully and comprehensively as evidence of a sophisticated and nuanced understanding of how the creative artifacts contribute to discipline. That's the convincing, sophisticated level. And I'll show you an example. Coherent treatment is, is still convincing. So references to contribution demonstrate an understanding of the nature of contribution and are presented capably and in context. And then you have the unconvincing, which is token treatment, which means that reference is typically more than a passing to contribution. is more than a passing reference, but it's disjointed, confused, incomplete. Attempts to go beneath the surface of token are not really successful. And then you have the incoherent, which is kind of um, the opposite, where it's more than stated at a passing surface level. It's actually um, uh, often conceptually unconnected to the research design because they're trying, to, they're trying so hard to make it work that it actually doesn't work. Now, bear in mind, as I've said, that these are all theses that have passed. So it's very interesting to show the see this four different level, or we've come up with four different levels. 
we'll just see what you think. Because again, these are all anonymized. Um, and I've highlighted keywords just to show the kind of to, to kind of highlight the kind of language that they're using, which is all this reasoning to, to you know be able to reason for something to to make an argument for something. So this is one that we would uh, passages from one that we we coded as sophisticated. So creative practice is conceived as an intervention into subjectivity and creative works are frames and artifacts that both document this interventional process and express or disseminate new sub subjectivities. Script expresses critical ideas around subjectivity in a broad and accessible way and disseminates narrative expressions of queer subjectivity, specifically expressions of liminal masculinity. This is obviously the, the subject matter. The practice element is the application of research findings arising from the literature review and analysis and the writing of the script, as well as the application of knowledge garnered about the writing process itself, acquired through practice, research, dialogue with colleagues, blah, blah, blah. So this this one uh, is very confident around how the creative work and how the practice is actually contributing to knowledge and it's using expressions that actually you could cite in like, you know, if you were doing a review of uh, methodology stuff or looking at examples to, to, to substantiate your own um, methodology for your own project, you can actually quote from this. It's very clear, convincing, and it really hangs together with this thesis. So this is a draft of what we've come up with. That's just one example, but um, we're trying to come up with composites to describe what characterizes a, each of these four levels of contribution to knowledge. So in this case, a convincing, sophisticated thesis. Thesis of this type discussing the complex and nuanced manner how the screenplay or screenwriting practice was conceptualized as research. Where relevant, they discuss how this changed during the candidature in such detail that a contribution to creative practice research itself is produced. Thesis text evidences the high level of reflexivity position well above the post formal level. That's an educational term for basically being able to think about thinking. Not only determining the clear logic between research question methodology and contribution, but also how screenwriting was used to continually test and augment the research design. So it was always part of this process. It was iterative and then they knew that if things changed, that the, the work with the screenplay would also change and it would feed back into the theory. Uh, where obstacles were met and overcome, I had to put the screenwriting thing in there, of course. Uh, the thesis uses these instances to devise theoretical and practical implications, often detailed in ways that can be cited by others. These theses of this type of a strong command of voice are moved sophisticated in between different stances and time frames, comfortably bringing together theory and or practice based ideas and literature to create a reflexive account of the research journey and its implications for others. Contribution is very well understood and articulated. And then the complex understanding of how it might be conceptualized, tested, challenged, or adapted to other contexts. So basically, it's this kind of high level of awareness of what they've done and how it, if, if, if a piece of the jigsaw changed, it could be adapted in other ways and how it would fit other disciplines. There's a real strong awareness, conceptual awareness and, and reasoning. But these are very rare, by the way. Then you have your next one, which is still convincing, but what we, what we call coherent. So this is examples from thesis that we think is convincing, but just coherent. This research led practice PhD is three running consists of two parts, feature film title, which I've taken out, and an accompanying critical dissertation explores, analyzes and reflects on the creative process. The screenplay is written in the genre of blah and explores blah. Uh, the dissertation provides a framework um, you know, understanding, guiding, applying genre techniques to the practice of screenwriting. In this PhD, then, this particular theory has been analysed, compiled and narrowed down to six principles designed to inform the screenwriter. Uh, and that's the, the, the name of the screenplay as well. I, th uh, I then apply these principles to the analysis of a contemporary produced case study uh, in order to further understand and examine the mechanisms of this particular genre screenwriting. Finally, I apply these theories and techniques under examination to discussion of the screenwriting process that I use in my own screenplay. The aim is to investigate and utilize these generic elements and technical devised conventions and structures of the genre in order to understand and write a genre of screenplay 
and thus contribute in creating a framework for the genre's screenwriters. So this is, um, again, convincing it's very aware of what's done. It knows what is what and how it all fits together and which um, method is producing what kind of contribution. I would say it's probably a little more procedural than the, the other one, which is not like sophisticated and it's kind of languaging and it's complexity, but it's still convincing and coherent. So there's no doubt that this candidate knows what they've done and how it all hangs together. And we don't really have the vibe over here very much. Some universities do. Uh, it's coming in a bit more now, but you know, if you in, in a vibe, if you ask someone to explain how they'd done something or how it all came together, the first one, this one could quite easily do that. So in this one, th this is the, what we're thinking around this summary is thesis of this type present comfortably, capably and consistently how the screenplay or screenwriting practice was conceptualized as research from the outset. And if relevant, how it changed during the candidature. These is text evidence as a level of reflexivity at the post formal level with a clear logic between research question methodology and contribution broadly and the role of the screenplay or screenwriting practice specifically. Where obstacles have been met and overcome, the thesis, thesis convincingly details these instances and the lessons learned or the implications for theory and for practice. Theses of this type move comfortably between different stances, incorporating personal reflection, field and industry positions, and how the screenplay or screen practice, research, screenwriting practice fares in these contexts. Contribution to knowledge, practice, industry, society, and so on is well articulated and appears to emerge directly from the study. For those perhaps a lack of complex understanding of how the contribution might be conceptualized, tested, challenged, or adapted to other contexts. So it's still strong, but it's not like, oh my God, wow, quote all this. Like in this one, you can imagine from the text I showed you that you might say, I don't know, um, in a study of blah, this researcher did this, this, you kind of summarize it. Whereas in this one, you would probably be wanting to be quoting directly from, you know, uh, like blah, 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 my thesis is also conceived as an intervention that you know you would be quoting from because it's written so well reasoned well now the next level of course we come to is um is unconvincing now all caveats here that you know this is obviously how we've approached the work this is what we think and you know others may disagree and obviously they've passed um so this is the, the kind of the token treatment one. So this is where the candidate in the thesis says, the conclusions of this examination, they've done some underpinning research of a particular type to inform this creative work, uh, will then be synthesized into an original creative artifact to better demonstrate the aforementioned tropes. This will take the form of a series of screenplays for a contemporary genre TV series complemented by a show Bible, an industry document which provides an in-depth overview of the world or of original show. Okay, having now analyzed the key text of this genre in depth, the next chapter of the dissertation will attempt to identify the key narrative and thematic considerations unique to these texts. Okay, good. This will then be used to construct the creative artifact, which will aim to represent the archetypal genre. So, in a way, you might go, well, it kind of makes sense, but there's a few things that I think are slightly problematic with this one. Um, you know, the conclusions will be synthesized into an original creative artifact. I'm not well, like, what does that mean? You synthesize, but then there's a step between synthesis and an application, so it's not quite clear what that means. But to better demonstrate, uh, so if you know, if you said. It, I mean, based on the text only, this candidate would say, if we said to the candidate, how is your screenplay uh, contributing to knowledge? They would say, well, um, the, the screenplay better demonstrates uh, the tropes I've analysed by looking at other TV shows. So that better demonstrates, not really sure what that means. And then, you know, this idea of later on, you know, that um, the underpinning research will be used to construct the creative artefact. I know what they mean there, but it's probably not quite the right. It's a bit limiting and well, what does that mean? Which will aim to represent the archetypal genre. So it's like saying, um, 
I've done all this research about this. It's going to underpin it. And whereas the first one would be like, it will, you know, script will then be used as an intervention into this or represent subjective notions of this person is saying, uh, you know, the underpinning research will represent the thing that I've just researched. It, well, that's not really contributing to knowledge. It's almost like illuminating, but it's not. Is it really contributing to knowledge? So that so that slightly unconvincing, but you know, clearly attempting, but not so convincing. So we've characterized this as these types, sorry, theses of this type show an attempt to articulate the contribution of knowledge, but most often using only procedural statements. The relationship between creative and um, creative artifacts and the underpinning research is discussed briefly, sometimes relying on sweeping statements or cliches rather than perceived detail and conviction. There's no integration of theory or methodological concepts in these statements, rather a very simplistic how to approach. Signs of pre reflective thinking are evidenced by a lack of situation, the contribution and wider context, including how the creative artifact is positioned within the field. So this pre reflective thinking there's this idea that as a true reflective thinker or reflective practitioner or someone who can reflect. The kind of true definition of re reflective thinkers or reflective judgment is that you can basically. You see all the parts that exist in the thing that you are working on. You know how they all interrelate and you can tell someone if something shifts or moves or whatever. You know what the implications are and how it would change things and you could quickly then re see the problem or you could repackage it. Pre reflective is you can talk. This is what I did, but you can't foresee like if things change, they can't quite conceptualize how what you did would have to change and what the new outcome would be. So that's the difference between reflective and pre reflective. So the, we where is position these unconvincing in the pre reflective. And then finally, uh, incoherent, unconvincing. So there's two two examples here from two separate pieces. This first one is really interesting. And again, the you know the attempts there, it's just the, the way it's the thesis is uh, doesn't really hang together. So this says the purpose of my practice later research was related to two separate problems. Firstly, how could I, as a screenwriting lecturer at a university, combine narrative theory with actual screenwriting practice? Secondly, how could I, as a screenwriting practitioner, facilitate collaboration with other filmmakers in the particular industry context in order to maximise the chances of a film getting made? The answer to both of these questions, I suspected, lay in a more structured understanding of the screenplay draft development. This gave rise to my central research question. How does one usefully define the purpose of each particular feature screenplay draft in a particular context environment? So this is kind of interesting because there's kind of two separate things going on here. It's interesting and true that, and you know, in many cases, this is the case that someone who's doing a PhD in this area might be working in university, but that's not that's not what the thesis is about. I mean, you could do a thesis about that. You could do something about teaching screenwriting at university or becoming a university lecturer from industry, whatever, but that's not the same. So this, too, this is unconvincing because it doesn't make sense. And then the research question, how does one usually define the purpose of each particular screenplay draft? Well, you can define something, but that's not necessarily contributing. It, it would be more like, you know, how might uh, new definitions of the purpose of the draft lead to, so there's, a, there's, like, there's like a stopping before, so it's not really clear what the contribution is going to be here. So this is a good example of potentially someone who wasn't really, they'd done the thing but weren't really aware what, what it all meant. And then this one, but a separate one, could I write a script that would demonstrate that women are capable of working in any male dominated occupation if they are allowed to work free from harassment and in a style that suits them? Could I write a script that would demonstrate that assigning genders to occupations is unnecessary and that stereotypes are unhelpful? And so the television series Blah was born. Now, no one's going to question the intention behind this and I hope no one would come, you know, disagree with what this person's trying to do. But you 
as, as, as research script or PhD can't prove any of this. You actually, it's actually impossible. How can a screenplay that you write based on experience uh, prove that working in this, that women can do this? Uh, and yes, we know that designing general occupations may be necessary, whatever. But, um, you know, then the script could be a way of, um, you know, intervening in discourse around blah in order to shed a, a new new light on or to offer a counter representation or to use a new uh, story world. Applied to a particular context in order to try and dislodge ideological whatevers that could be a contribution, but this. Uh, which is what they were trying to do, really, but they just couldn't reason for it. And, you know, the word demonstrate, you know, you're demonstrating is not a contribution. So, you, so hopefully you can see where I'm coming from here around this different levels of what does contribution look like. And hopefully if you look at those examples of the things I've mentioned, like sight lines and text, you can see from the research statements how the people are framing these as contributing to something. And so you can get a strong sense of what a contribution could look like. And if we have time and questions, which is almost there, I can then um, maybe feel some questions about that. So these theses of this type typically go beyond a brief and procedural attempt by articula uh, articulation, but by doing so, they confuse the reader about what the contribution is. There's often a disconnect between the research question, the methodology and the findings. Sometimes these theses, theses in this category of proposed contributions are impossible to achieve through the creative artifact, making the examination of the screenplay as an outcome of research difficult. There can be an unhelpful confluence of personal aims and passion and research methods and outcomes in this kind of thesis, making the thesis feel disjointed and incoherent. So to summarize um, very finely, uh, experienced researchers possess a suite of skills honed over time in the context of intellectual risk and critique. But the key thing I, I guess I'm saying today is that, you know, you've got to understand what generating new knowledge is, what it means in your field, what it looks like, and how you would actually go about that method logically, and then be able to reason, or articulate how that has all come together. And if you can't kind of see that and think about that, i.e. if you're doing a PhD, if you you know talk with your supervisors about that because it's really important. If you that's when it can come unstuck. And I've done quite a few Viva PhDs, obviously other countries have a Viva like you you, you have. Um, and it is quite clear in the Viva sometimes when they haven't even thought about how it all hangs together. And they, they even though they we might be able to see what they've contributed and we can see snippets of it here and there and everywhere, asking the candidate say what have you contributed where do we find it and how did you arrive at the contribution that's where most candidates get really uh, confused and, and can't quite articulate it and that's actually the core of doing a research degree to be honest it's yes it's about the, the outputs thesis and the creative work but it's also about having those doctoral level thinking and reasoning and reflective skills to be able to position it all and reason for what you've done as a research project that's contributing to something new and you can prove it because all the underpinning research you can point to it and say well these practitioners did this or this theory says there's a gap in this and therefore in my screenplay i use these techniques or i've used this form or i've uh, uncovered a new way of representing whatever it is so you've got to really have it all connected okay uh uh, oh no, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna leave that there for a second. I'm gonna. I want to make sure there's a bit of time for questions because I know I've been talking a long time. Um, we got twelve minutes. Thank you so much, Craig. It was absolutely fascinating, and I cannot tell you how much I've learned from your presentation today. That really is great. So I'm gonna very quickly ask two questions. One is more a comment if you want to kind of add on it. And the second is a question, I'll quickly pass it on to uh, everyone else in the uh, um, public. And thank you so much, because I know it's probably one o'clock, 1 a.m. where you are right now. So thank you for staying with us. Um, so 
obviously one of the, I mean, again, so many things I had to kind of uh, pick the things I wanted to ask you, but the, the, the one thing which really interests me, obviously this idea of how you said uh, in relation to one of the resources you were talking, how you might produce or someone might produce a script and then industry person will say, well, what is it? And obviously you might not have a value for the industry, but it will have a great value for in terms of research and then original contribution to knowledge. And of course there's lots of uh, literature about it and it's quite interesting, um, but then some people still aim to do a kind of research which is both great contribution to knowledge and uh, brings a lot of value to industry. Do you think uh, there should be a preference for researchers between the two? And, and if it doesn't matter, how do you reconcile it as a, from kind of a creative ambitious, if you like? Yeah, look, I guess, I guess it depends you know, where someone comes from and why they're doing it. The ideal, really, I would say, is to, to have that uh, you know, a clear contribution that meets all the definitions, but that also has industry currency somehow. Um, you know, whether it's something that's acceptable or accepted for, you know, being commissioned or screened or, or whatever it is or produced, or even like if it's something where the where the there's learnings about what you've done that could inform industry, industry practice itself. Now that's really hard. And, you know, I guess maybe in this area out of all the others and filmmaking probably as well, it's, there's probably the least number of documented examples of that kind of industry uptake or, or um, impact. In creative writing, you know, um, it's very common that people will get their PhD novel published, I guess, because there's, well, Arguably, there's not as much risk or well, there's certainly not as much money needed to make something. And there's always kind of a publisher for something, whether it's small press or major, whatever. Screenplay, screenwriting, production, it's 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 even independently produced work will cost a lot of money. So there's that. It's um, and maybe because screenwriting is more arguably more industrial, seen as more industrial than other areas compared to like say contemporary art or again creative writing or even dance really you know it, it probably hasn't quite yet had the enough of a history for industry people to really understand what it is and what it what it can be it may be that in the next decade or more that if we get graduates working in in, in industry who know the value of what it can be you can then start to uh, make stronger connections but I, I absolutely believe that I mean look some people will produce a creative research work to push boundaries and to do things differently and maybe purposely don't want it to be mainstream or commissioned or, or produced or whatever but um, and the question there would be why I suppose but you know it would be good if we could come to an understanding that and I think we are seeing this now more and more that creative research work is at the level of kind of industry work and that it should be um, somehow, whether it's, you know, yeah, somehow kind of accepted or validated or, or taken up somehow. But when it's something really different and experimental and looks totally different and is not, you know, that's tricky. But you never know. Yeah, I think it's a it's an idea for a paper itself, like how these two things can work in many different ways. Uh, so I think we, I, I could follow up, but I, I, I'm uh, conscious of time. So how about we just open it uh, for questions? I can see some people smiling already. So uh, if you have a question, just put it in a chat or ideally unmute yourself and just ask. Uh, and then if not, I have other questions. But yeah, I'm sure some people will have something. Oh, no. Hi, hi, Craig. Um, apart from being a bit mind blowing, thank you very much. You've obviously uh, gone through with sort of uh, archaeological rigor into this whole thing, which is a bit scary. Mm. <laughs> I think I did, I think I'll just pack up and just go and live in a cave somewhere. Oh, <laughs> but um, following on from Agatha's point, point, what? And you sort of touched on it, but you didn't. Um, I'm just sort of thinking of when one starts to produce and starts thinking in a heretical point of view. 
um, for one's practice. Uh, how how do you think that can be sort of um, argued with for the point of view? I know it sounds a bit daft. I'm thinking through so from the, the point of view of the survivor, because actually you can write all about it. But if you're then having to argue it in a, a vibe without being too um, off the wall, as it were, how, how does that, how do you see that manifesting itself? I know that's a bit theoretical. Or you can tell me to just go go back into my cave. But So do you mean if in any kind of thesis or are you talking about the ones where it might be, um, I don't know, it might be really different. I'm just I'm just yes, no, I'm thinking really, really different, really experimental. I mean, I, you know, yeah, just personally, yeah. uh, there's been quite, Agatha will know, there's been quite a challenge with, with the work that I started to what it is becoming. Um, yeah. And there's been sort of quite, I mean, in a positive way, um, but things are very fluid as to what's expected and what what has uh, what is going to be manifested as an end result. Um, and there's, yeah, right. you know, in a way, to me, that sort of feels a bit heretical where, you know, there's a bit of heresy going on between the practice, uh, um, the theory and the ac academic expectation, as it were. Yeah, well, I guess one thing to say, and I'm uh, hoping this is relevant, but is that, you know, there's different ways you can write up a thesis. You might do the more traditional kind of, uh, I guess, almost linear um past tense kind of this is what it did you know mm. standard mm. chapters findings mm. or in these it's very common in, in our areas to have more of a personalized almost like a journey through type of thesis where mm. you actually pull together mm. theory practice reflections in each mm. iteration whether it's mm. um experiments or draft work and you might not have a final work i mean you might it might be actually a series of Mm, um, mm. And they're, they're actually, I think those are harder to do because you've got to navigate multiple voices at once. Yeah. Critical, creative, Definitely. reflective. Mm. But if you can do it well, they're actually the best. Mm -hmm. They're the best ones. If you can do it well, they're like, they're just like, wow, brilliant. Okay. Thank you. So it's amazing. It's just like, thank you very much. <laughs> Is there anyone in the room who'd like to ask a question? Hi, I think I have a question as well. Uh, I'm not sure if I have time enough, but let's try. Um, that's wonderful, Greg's series. I think that's a really, um, yeah, you can really make it clear the, the, the different possibilities you can you can make a contribution to knowledge. But I think this idea, I think the last thing you mentioned about, you know, the expectation of the, the PhD must be equal for the, you know, the industry level. And think about film, filmmaking industry, something quite tricky as well, you know, we talk about lots and lots of money, investments, and, and there's a huge community outside the industry that works. I don't know if it's the, the margin or not, but a huge community of practitioners working and uh, festivals that's not really in the industry. And I think that's uh, a kind of, um, do you think that's expectation for, for the Viva uh, that the work must be equal to the industry? Because I think I'm concerned with the new, the new directions of universities, especially in the UK, when everything is driving for the industry and for, you know, and a little bit of lack of uh, criticality and anyway. Yeah, I've stopped here because no, that's right. I know, I, I know what you mean. I think you're right. Yeah, I mean, the, I guess I use the word industry loosely, but um, and some of it might be more community based. It might be community filmmaking. It could be community community filmmaking for social development. You know, it might be a different kind of. Um, there's a whole field of communication for development. Um, you know, I think, but I think there should be some level of creative work where it, it would stand up to some kind of peer review of some appropriate nature because yeah. otherwise if it's just like crap mm. it's kind of like well yeah like why are we you know unless it's purposely being crap but it, but then you'd have to find some conferences about crap studies and have it peer you know it still has to somehow go through some gig there are some universities um 
I've got a candidate who's studying in Estonia, and he has to, for his filmmaking PhD, he actually has to have an international screening of his film before he can even submit it. Mm. Now that could be obviously anything to be Central Film Festival, but mm. so there are some universities that do stipulate that. In back in the in point of idea, back in the day, people always used to say it has to be of a publishable standard. Right. But these days, it's kind of like, well, what does that even mean? I mean, you know, mm. I think it's yeah. But you're right; there has to be some level of craft. There has to be. I got strong. you. Yeah. Actually, it's for dissemination, right? In the yeah, in terms of yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, Francisco. Thank you, everyone. I think it's time to let uh, Craig uh, get some rest because uh, <laughs> it's probably very late. But thank you so much once again. It was absolutely wonderful to hear you talk. I will definitely get back to you with a million of questions after this at some point. Uh, what I would just like to say before we wrap it up that if you, because I see some people I don't recognize in the uh, participant list, so if you are not on my uh mailing list just just get in touch with him because i will be sharing craig's two amazing articles and a recording from this uh session uh well to your emails but if i don't have your email obviously i won't do it so if you if you want to be part of it just do it and just to say that our next uh session will happen as always on last wednesday of may and we will have uh erica rodriguez from lusofona university in in lisbon and she's also part of film eu uh, alliance and she's gonna be also talking about phd related stuff so she's gonna be talking about mapping a sustainable support model for practice-based researchers superv supervisors and examiners so kind of continues on what we've been uh, hearing from craig today so once again thank you so very much million times uh, thank you craig thank it was you. absolutely fascinating and uh have a great night and the rest of you have a great afternoon thank you thanks everyone thank, thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.